I bet everyone has played with this kind of motors in their childhood. By supplying power to it with the help of a battery and see it working, we feel like a scientist. But have you ever noticed, by this way, it only rotates at a constant speed. So what about if we want to change the speed of this motor? So in this video, we will design some circuit and see if we can control the speed of this motor. Someone told me that pulse width modulation or in short PWM is the most effective and efficient way to control the speed of the motor. So I decided to design the circuit myself on a software in order to test whether it will work or not. I utilized any triple five timer IC in a A stable multi vibrator configuration to generate a PWM signal whose duty cycle can be controlled by a potentiometer. As you can see after running the simulation, the any triple five timer IC is successfully generating a PWM signal. It has a fixed frequency of around 10 kHz and I can change the duty cycle with the help of this potentiometer. Perfect. One thing to note here that this output from this any triple five timer is not powerful enough to run the motor. That's why we have to use a MOSFET in order to amplify the signal. Now I don't want to waste your time by making the circuit on a breadboard and then make a permanent version. Instead, let's directly solder the components on the PCB board. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I've already tested the circuit in the simulation. Spoiler alert, it won't. So here are the components you will need. First of all, this grandfather of all ICs, any triple five timer, an IRF Z44N MOSFET, a 10 kilo ohm potentiometer to control the speed, two 1 kilo ohm resistors, and two 1N5819 Schottky diode, which basically means fast switching diode, a small piece of perf board, and two 10 nanofarad capacitors which are too heavy for me to pick up, so I skipped it. Okay, now, here comes my favorite part, soldering. I placed all the components on the prof board one by one, starting with the IC and end up using terminal blocks for the input and output connections. Now, enjoy the soldering montage of, I don't know how many seconds. After completing the soldering, which roughly took me about an hour, I connected some loose wires at the input and output terminal. To test the circuit, I connected the 12 volt supply at the input terminal and connected the output wires to the oscilloscope. And surprise, no signal at the output. It means something is wrong. Meanwhile, I was playing with the circuit, I touched the IC which was hot as hell. The circuit is consuming about 300 milliamps even though the output is unloaded. Something is definitely wrong with the circuit. I used a multimeter in beeping mode to check if I have done the right connections, which I did. I'm proud of myself. I came to a result that maybe the IC is faulty or something. Now guess what, I have to desolder the IC and solder a new one. But before doing that, 
I use this any triple five timer blink circuit in order to first check whether the IC is good or not. Afterwards I inserted the IC in its place and soldered it with some extra care because I don't want to short anything. At this stage all of you are thinking that it will work now and that's what I thought. So I directly connected the motor at the output terminal and tried to power the circuit. See that's a problem. The motor spins for a brief moment and then stopped working. I also tried rotating the potentiometer and nothing. Seemed like the circuit is dead and there is no current flow at all. Hmm, something is missing. You see the problem we are facing here is quite interesting because I know my circuit is right and the IC is not defective at all. So I again desoldered the IC from the PCB and soldered a new one. I know the problem is basically due to the inductive nature of the motor. That's why this time I don't want to again fry up the circuit Instead, let's attach some kind of resistive load like a light bulb, power the circuit and observe the output on the oscilloscope. Finally, as you can see that we are getting a beautiful PWM signal and I'm able to control the brightness without any problem. But what about the motor? You see, if we connect the motor, it will again fry the IC because of its inductive nature. Let me show you something. If I power this motor with the help of a square wave generator and observe the output, you see, that's a problem. The motor is producing these negative voltage bursts. The peaks are of around 68 volts, which is far greater than the maximum supply voltage of any triple five timer I see. Now at this stage, some people might think, can't we need DC voltage to run a motor? Yes, you're right. And the answer is quite simple. You see the motor is a big inductive load as it consists of coils and we know in coils current cannot change instantly. What I mean is if I measure the current flow of this motor by mirroring the voltage across a 10 ohm power resistor as you can see that the current is almost DC. As the frequency of switching is quite large the motor will assume as it is getting a stable voltage somewhere between the high and low levels of PWM. Now the question is how we can remove those peak voltages? The solution is quite simple. By connecting a short key diode at the input of the motor in a reverse polarity, the problem can be removed completely because the negative pulses will be shorted out by the diode and will not flow back into the circuit. This kind of configuration is called free wheeling as the diode is free wheeling the negative pulses. As you can see now the circuit is working happily and I can control the speed of the motor without any problem. If you notice on the oscilloscope the problem of negative pulses has gone forever. Now you can connect any kind of motor with this thing no matter how big it is make sure not to exceed the voltage rating of the IC which is 18 volts and the current of 49 amps at least in theory. That's why I recommend not to use it for more than 15 volts and 10 amps. If you feel that your MOSFET is warm to touch, then you don't need a heat dissipator, but if it's too hot to touch, then you will definitely need a heat dissipator like this one, or probably a bigger one. If you enjoyed watching this video and learned a thing or two, then don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my channel. If you don't like my video, the YouTube algorithm will consider it as a meaningless video, no joke. So be sure to like and subscribe to my channel and I will see you in my next video. So stay tuned.